my presentation today is going to try to highlight some of the often misunderstood issues regarding art advising and the, the status of being an agent. Uh, I'm also going to introduce the concept of fiduciary obligations via agency for art advisors. Many of you may not be that familiar with uh, the, the concept of fiduciary obligations, but it is a fact of law that all of you who are engaged in art advising are actually de facto subject to them in, in, to the extent that you're acting as an agent of a client. So this will give us an opportunity to run through some of the considerations that are uh, actually structuring and framing uh, your practice, even if they may be legal and somewhat removed from everyday practice. Agency relationships are at the heart of the art world. Notable examples of agency relationships are in the representation of artists by galleries, the representation of consigners by the auction houses, and the third most prevalent form of agency, which is our topic tonight, is the relationship between the art advisor and the buyer. The single most important thing for art advisors, collectors, and gallerists to understand is when advisors are acting as an agent, they are legally obligated to be their client's fiduciaries. Whether, whether it's in a contract or not in a contract or not in contemplation or no one has raised the issue, the law imposes those obligations. That's the first take home message. Whether one is aware of them or not, they are simply de facto in place and operative before court and at law. So fiduciary obligations order unique and, and valuable social relationships. Fiduciary obligations are found in many settings where trust is critical. They're found in doctor-patient relationships, lawyer-client relationships, amongst partners, and in corporate governance. Fiduciary duties are imposed by society to balance power differentials. So we have, we have structures, legal structures, in society that anticipate a situation where an advisor has superior knowledge, superior access to information, may be able to be uh, making decisions in their own judgment for a client, and where the client doesn't have access to the same type of empowerment, and the law has regimes to increase the security of the dependent party, of the vulnerable party. Rel relationships of trust in the art context are inseparable from uh, fiduciary obligations. Now, we have to pause for a moment and understand very clearly what is special about this fact. When fiduciary obligations are active, and they're active by law, they're not active by cho choosing them or not choosing them, they're simply there. They change the nature of obligations that people owe to each other in very unexpected and dramatic ways. Instead of being equals uh, who are parties to a contract, fiduciary obligations create two distinct roles. The fiduciary, that is, the person who has power over another, here the art advisor, and the entrustor, or principal, here the buyer. It is central to understand that even if you come together under a contract, that is, an agreement that needs to benefit each party, when fiduciary duties are present, they can trump any agreement. I've stressed it, but I'll stress it again because it's a, one of the core factors that gives fiduciary obligations the scope and breadth of their impact. Fiduciary obligations are made by judges and courts. By default, they trump contracts and, and other non-legal agreements. Fiduciary obligations can even be found between an art advisor and a client, even if both have explicitly disclaimed them. The court may step into a transaction, trans into a contractual situation, and say a, the contract between an art advisor and a client is unconscionable. It, does, it simply doesn't have validity because it, it injures the basic rights of a client to certain fundamental legal norms. Court, it's important to, to understand that courts determine when these fiduciary duties exist and determine their breadth and depth. As a fiduciary, an art advisor must be loyal. They must be free of conflict of interest. Secondly, not only does the law impose this duty of loyalty, it also understands that this duty of loyalty has to be tempered for circumstances. A court can step in and say that a art advisor has not exercised due care in, the, in, in their profession. For example, an art advisor has to be prudent. Being prudent means being vigilant, independently vigilant about conflicts of interest and transparency. They cannot wait for a client, to, or, or, or the fact of waiting for a client to pose questions is no defense. 
against a potential breach of these fiduciary obligations. This is independent of whether a client understands these obligations, is aware of them, demands them or not. The, the onus is on the art advisor as the fiduciary to understand these concepts, and, the, and legally they will be bound to them, even if the client is unaware of them. We've covered briefly the concept of the advisor as an agent and fiduciary. Now let us turn to the devil in the detail. What does that actually mean? I mean, what is, it, what is the impact that it will have on art advisors in their in their day-to-day -day practice? When an art advisor has an agency <coughs> relationship to a client, they must represent only that client's interests. And I, an art advisor cannot pursue any other interest whatsoever by law, and is under a complete obligation to maintain transparency. The client is not obligated to ask for this, or to provide for this, or even to know this. The law imposes this as a, as a default, no matter what an, an art advisor thinks or has done or practiced up to date. And there is no easy legal argument that can be brought if there is a, 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 a difficult situation with the client to defend the fact of not having maintained that loyalty. It's not a contractual situation, well, the client didn't pay me, therefore I breached confidentiality or I breached co uh, conflict of interest provisions. That's irrelevant before the law because the fiduciary obligations trump whatever contractual issues are at hand. And ignorance is no defense because as, uh, as advisors, the obligation is to be professional. The, the operative assumption by the law is that the client is vulnerable. A key aspect of the fiduciary obligations that an art advisor has is the exclusion of third parties and third party interests. The law imposes a fiduciary duty to, to not do or agree to do anything that would benefit anyone else other than your client. And uh, an, uh, an art advisor cannot generate or intend to generate any profit, any benefit for anyone other than that client without disclosure and agreement on, 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 behalf, on, on the part of the client. Third parties, and this is common practice, can include uh, excluded third parties, those par third parties who can receive no legal benefit from the actions of an art advisor without full disclosure and agreement on the part of the client include artists, gallerists, other collectors, other clients, other art advisors, museums, framers, art handlers, and other service providers, etc. The client, again, to stress the, the, this important dimension, is not obligated to ask for this, to ask for the exclusion of this. You, all art advisors, are obligated to understand this and practice this by law. A further deep responsibility of an art advisor as an agent, as a fiduciary, is to have no undisclosed profits. In fact, the law mandates that art advisors are obligated to turn over any undisclosed profits. Every undisclosed profit an art, an art advisor makes is automatically owed by law to the client. The client is here also not obligated to ask for this, not, able, not obligated to enforce this, nor make this a provision, uh, an explicit provision of your relationship uh, to you as an art advisor. If the, if the matter ends up in court, an art advisor's default fiduciary obligation will force full disclosure and disgorging of all undisclosed profits. The exposure to this liability lasts years after the transaction. So years after a transaction, if a client, for whatever reason, is not satisfied or has uh, uh, the intuition that there is some conflict of interest or some breach of trust in a transaction, that client can go to a court and force full disclosure of all people connected to a transaction and the disgorging of any undisclosed profits. Even if they are unrelated, even if they were to benefit, and this is one of the curious things about fiduciary obligations, even if an art advisor argues, well, if I put, if I give that advantage to that, some, that, that hidden advantage to somebody, it will close the deal, my client will be happy, they'll get the work that they want, uh, but I'm not going to disclose this because this would re reveal too much information or potentially uh, compromise someone, someone else's interest, that is no defense because of the, the legally imposed obligation of the singular loyalty. So the next, and uh, it's within the context that we've already covered, but to, let's deal with it as an independent concept, transparency. What does transparency mean here? Even if a client agrees to allow an art advisor to generate a benefit for someone other than the client, 
So you've come clean, or you, you actually included a high level of detail uh, in your discussions with your client about how many other people are involved in the deal, what possible benefit that could uh, accrue to them. Even there, you don't have a defense because the law imposes additional burdens on you. The art advisor must act fairly, and the art advisor must disclose in a situation where there are any potential other uh, actors who are gaining uh, benefit, they must disclose all the relevant information to the client so the client can make an informed decision. Even if everything looks great and everyone is in agreement in a moment, if a court, and remember, we'll go back to the notion that the fiduciary obligations are court-imposed obligations, if a court, after the fact, years after the fact, does not agree with the contextual understanding of the advisors and the client's understanding of fairness, they can reverse everything and they can take any benefit that has accrued to the art advisor and return it to the client without necessarily doing the same thing in tandem, which is to give any benefit received by the client back to the art advisor. Because the fiduciary obligations takes you off the rails of contract. And all art advisors are fiduciaries when they're agents of their clients. And this is independent of whether you have a contract or not. An art advisor who breaches fiduciary obligations is liable for any unfairness or any lack of transparency well after the transaction is over. So I'm going to come to the, to the end of this, this short presentation. In closing, I want to note that fiduciary duties on art advisors balance what, what are called agency costs. And here is a very brief definition of agency costs to get us again into a kind of a broader based understanding of the issue. Agency costs arise when the art advisor or agent takes discretionary but imperfectly observable actions that impact the client. So the fact of operating in the typical uh, discretion, and the, uh, which is very significant to the art world, subjects the art advisor to a significant burden uh, and moral hazard of conflict of interest. And fiduciary duties are precisely there as a tool or as a method of a a addressing wrongdoing if it becomes manifest or if there's an intuition on the part of a client that it could be present. Despite being not well known, fiduciary obligations and, and the agency relationship are at the core of art advising. In fact, the entire profession is legally defined by them, whether many advisors are familiar with this fact or not. The vast increase in the role of art advising means that many people interacting with the profession are doing so without understanding how exposed they are. Uh, we hope with this panel that we can increase awareness and foster dialogue around this important issue. And I thank you for your attention and I look forward to our questions later on.